Welcome, everyone. What a fantastic turnout for a snowy Friday afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is a topic near and dear to our hearts here in Spokane and the Eastern Public Health Program for sure. And we're so grateful to have Pat Justice with us today um, to talk about some of our state level rural data. And she's also going to talk a little bit about what it means to be rural and um, some of those distinctions. Just as a heads up, we are currently accepting applications for a 2019 enrollment. Uh, we have fully online and in-person uh, classes, and so we are happy to start putting together our new cohort. So anyone looking to possibly pursue public health as a career, uh, do be in contact with us and let us know. Uh, we do these ground rounds every month, and we do archive them on YouTube. So if you go on and search EWUMPH, you'll find us right away, and you can see we have an archive decent one now of about eight ground rounds talks. So um, there we go. All there for your enjoyment. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Pat Justice, who is the Director of Rural Health at the Washington State Department of Health. And she has a fantastic uh, talk ready for you to get you grounded in rural language, what these things are, and how this impacts our aging community here in Washington State. And then I will follow up with a small project that I've been working on um, with rural elders uh, here on the east side of the state in Lincoln and Stevens County, where I gave them cameras and they took pictures of things that represent health and well being to them. And so I'll share some of those photos and some of those stories with you at the end. Well, my slide there has a very wet side kind of photograph, doesn't it? So um, I, I have to hit the myth right off the top that all of the rural country is on the east side of the mountains, because there's actually some on the other side too although you've got a good deal of it. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what rural means because that people think that's a really simple question and it's actually not. Some of you may have been exposed to this and we'll move through that pretty quickly as well as frontier. I'm gonna also fly fairly fast through some summary data on rural populations in our state and some characteristics of the rural healthcare system. And I'm doing that sort of briskly because I wanna spend the bulk of the time talking about rural communities and aging in rural communities and what that means and get you engaged in thinking about that. And then we'll finish up with drawing out some of your ideas about policy and what should be changing and I'll offer you a few of my own. So the official state definition of rural is at the county level. So we have 30 rural counties, nine urban. But a county level definition we find really blunt. Um, anybody been to Darrington? Yeah, so what would you say about Darrington? <laughs> yeah, it's very rural. It's about 1,300 people or so. It was cut off by the Oso landslide, like they had to drive 150 miles around or something to get out. Um, and it's characterized as urban under that state definition because the entire uh, county of Snohomish is urban. Um, so there's another categorization some of you have probably heard of, which is RUCA and actually whammy at, at your uh, the other side of the apple cup. Um, they were some of the people who put that together originally. And then we commonly use a four category RUCA, which is urban, suburban, large rural, and small rural. And the point I wanna make about that is even that is not just like a slam dunk. There's all these codes and you have to know, so why are you defining it and for what purpose and where do you wanna get? So, RUCA has 11 major codes and 21 subcodes, and it's really about the relationship between places as much as it is the places themselves. So how, how long does it take you to get to essential services? What kind of roads do you need to travel? What kind of weather do you need to get through? What kind of topography? Um, all kinds of things. And in fact, we redid our RUCA codes at the Department of Health, the epidemiologists, and they came up with two distinct coding schemas. One pays a lot more attention to commuting for employment and the other does not. So those kinds of subtleties are all involved in looking at RUCA. Um, one of the main points for me spending even a minute or two talking about these definitions is comparable data. If the data sets don't use the same definition of rural, you run into problems. So if I use county level, I get 16% rural, which is what I use when I really wanna make a point about <laughs> rural having more people. But if I use a sub-county level, I end up with 12%. So you can see that's kind of a, a big difference. So pay attention to that when you're looking at rural data. 
It's also relative. So the cartoon says, we want a cozy, secluded 20-acre farm surrounded by hills, trees, and streams within walking distance of shops, restaurants, schools, theaters, and hot night spots. Um, we have a certain legislator, which I will not name, who considers Bremerton rural. Um, if you've been there, it's, I wouldn't really go there. And by Ruka Coates, it's not. Um, people from Soap Lake, though, they go to the city of Moses Lake, right? And if they want to go to the really big city, they go to Wenatchee. So really, per people's perception of rural or not is also matters when you're talking with people because people define place in relationship to their own experience. So when people say rural, it could mean just about anything. Um, this is a picture of our state with a four tier, so that four category RUCA, and this is by zip code. We have another one that's by census tract that's even more discreet. Um, so this is, enforces my point that actually we do have some rural on the west, west side. Um, you know, there's what I call Pugetopolis, right, which is where we have most of our population. It's pretty interesting. Oregon has 4 million and some, and we have 7 million and some, but they have more rural residents than we do. Uh, I sat and really calculated it because I was looking at rural home health, and they had the same number of agencies. And I'm going, but we have so many more people. What's that about? But they have a much higher percentage of their population living in rural, and they lack a Pugetopolis, which is where a lot of our population sits. So frontier, and believe it or not, there's like many definitions of frontier, and I'm not going to labor that. But the most common one at the federal level is six to seven persons per square mile. And so this chart gets at the light yellow ones are the ones that are truly under six. There's four of them in Washington, but if you go for 10 and fewer, you bring in another four, which are the dark gold ones. Okanagan County, as many of you know, is large enough that it's actually larger than three different states in the United States. And um, we can probably guess which ones those are. So I think of it as the quintessential frontier county, even though um, you know it's a little over six, but still. And people would say in my circles, kind of esoteric circles, I guess, but that frontier is qualitatively different than rural. That you, that you hit a lot of different issues. And the, the health disparities and inequities are at a different caliber and magnitude. All right, so enough about definitions. Now I'm gonna just sort of fly through some data. Um, when we look at ethnic and race, um, rural has more folks of Hispanic background, American Indian and Alaska Native. When you look at Asian and Black or African American, urban is much more significant. It's probably not surprising to anyone as we look around. When we look at income, unemployment, and education, you can see the disparities in rural where there is lower per capita income, higher poverty, higher unemployment, and fewer people um, completing high school. So I realize this is kind of a long laundry list, but this really gets at, and many of you may know about this if you're public health students, um, that in rural areas, people have higher rates of the things that we would hope they didn't and lower rates of the behaviors we'd hope they would. Now, those are based on big population averages. Are there exceptions to that all over the place? I don't want to make some gross generalization. But just looking at the data, and I apologize, I have a headline that decided to go errant there. Um, that wasn't the one I got. <laughs> I didn't PDF it when I sent it to her, and you know the PowerPoint thing. Um, but, you know, Rural areas have higher rates of smoking, of obesity, of women who smoke during pregnancy, lower rates of things like colorectal cancer screening, um, all sorts of things. So when we look at life expectancy, um, I was looking at some national data and it said that there is a 20 year difference when you take the lowest and highest counties in the United States in terms of life expectancy. Geography is a disparity and I really, when people talk health disparities, if they leave out geography, I pick on them <laughs> nicely. Um, what is a slide set without opioids in 2019, <laughs> right? We can't go there. Um, so I have to tell a funny story because we have a new director to our um, research and analysis and data unit. And I have a rural epidemiologist and he was working out an updated set of maps for me. And his new boss flipped out because the numbers were so low, they weren't reliable. You can't show those, there's not enough. We call it the asterisk syndrome, right? Um, rural home health agencies are 
hate that compare website that CMS does because they end up with all asterisks and then people don't really know. Low numbers, low numbers. And when you move into value-based care, which I'm sure a few of you've heard about, and you're gonna be paid based on your quality and it only takes a couple sick patients to make your numbers go wonky, right? There's all sorts of issues about, do we have the sophistication to look at that and make it fair? So the things with the diagonals, those are the areas for which he was told he needed to suppress because <laughs> they weren't reliable enough. Those are the asterisks on the map. And so this one is by zip code. And then we'll blow it up just a little bit and look at it by county. So those counties with the slashes again in that lovely color um, <laughs> are suppressed because of the relative standard error rate. Um, but you can see where our, you know, dark, darker is higher rates of hospitalization involving opioids and heroin. That opioids and heroin always, heroin always throws me off. I guess opioids doesn't include heroin. But so these are, you know, talk about what's going on in our state and where the hot spots are, but it also talks about the difficulties with rural data and the numbers that we face. So a little bit about our system. We have, anybody heard of the term critical access hospital? I bet you have. So 25 beds or less meet some other criteria. They're supposed to be 35 miles apart unless the road's tough to travel. You gotta talk to Colfax and Pullman about that one. But um, only at this point, only 51.28% of our cause are providing OB services. So that's spooky. In fact, I know the CEO of the hospital in a very remote community's wife had an obstetric emergency and had to be airlifted out. Right? So that's spooky stuff, but it's also spooky if you're a rural health system and your nurses and physicians only do X number of births in a year and they don't feel like their skills are up. So we have a real dilemma around that. Um, the solution may be regional birthing centers where at least you don't have to drive so far. I'm not sure, we've got to solve it as a state. We have a few other rural hospitals under some other categorizations and these are CMS categorizations. Um, types of licensing or certification that means certain kinds of payment. Um, we also have a large number of public hospital districts in Washington. That's not true of other states. We have 56, 42 of them operate hospitals and 52 of the 56 are in rural areas. I think Evergreen Health in the east side of Seattle is one of the few urban ones. And that's out of 116 hospitals, by the way, our, you know, our rural hospitals being about 43 out of 116. Rural health clinics, and I had, a, I had an editor go through and take the caps out of every rural health clinic I wrote in this paper, and I went, excuse me, that is a proper noun. Um, it is a certification from CMS, and it's, it has a whole set of requirements, um, and you can compare and contrast, contrast excuse me, uh, federally qualified health centers from RHCs. RHCs, we have about 118. 30% of them are independent, and the rest of them are owned by mostly critical access hospitals. So those are called provider-based. In terms of rural home health, and if that's an interest of yours, I just released an opus on rural home health. I've been studying it for about the last year. We have 33 agencies serving Washington's rural counties. And of those, um, 15 or 45% also serve urban counties. We have big holes in our rural home health coverage. And we see it in terms of readmissions, and people coming back to emergency departments and human suffering. But I'll give an example. Um, there's an agency that has, we have certificate of need in this state. So we had an agency that had certificate of need for three rural counties. They confessed to me, and they didn't like this, it was a workforce shortage issue, that they could only serve about 40% of the referrals that they received. Now, they were reserving, uh, serving a very distant town only because they had a nurse who lived there. And when she moved, what happened? They didn't serve that town anymore, right? They tend to serve the patients that are in a kind of a radius around where their office is because they're incentivized to from a financial standpoint. I did hear testimony on, there's a bill um, right now, and I'm not, I am not advocating for anything here. I'm just stating facts. But there's a bill um, that the rural or that the Home Care Association of Washington's running for rural home health or for home health overall about Medicaid rates. Our Medicaid rates for home health are 50% of Oregon's. 
Yeah. So they're having a very hard time affording to travel um, to go see these patients with a population that's aging. So we'll get to that. A little bit more, uh, rural EMS. We have seven counties without advanced life support. That means if they, somebody has a pretty serious condition or accident, that they have to take a nurse out of the hospital to ride in the ambulance with them to attend to them on the way to Spokane or to Seattle or to Portland. Um, we have rural counties that are 70% or greater EMS workforce is that second list. And then if you look at all of our rural counties, um, there's another list that's, excuse me, 22 of, let me go there, 22 of 30 rural counties have greater than 50% volunteers. What do you think is happening to the volunteer workforce for rural EMS? It is, it's aging. And, and I, I'm not sure how we're going to recruit the next generation. It's expensive and time consuming to be an EMT. You have to pay a lot for the training. You have to, you know, and you have to love hanging upside down in a ditch, putting an IV in, in the dark, right? You have to love that. Um, so we have a problem and we're not the only ones. The whole United States and the, mostly the Western rural um, states are trying to figure out what are we going to do? I am going to get sort of um, into this for just a second because people assume you dial 911 and they will come, right? <laughs> but they don't acknowledge the contribution of the volunteers as a cost or an asset. So we've got some work to do with communities making some choices about what they want to do about that. So this is a picture that shows the, um, the number of EMS volunteers from 2014, 2017, I need to get 2018 up. If you were to trend the rate it, or the percentage, it would be the same, same line exactly. So it's going down rather significantly. Federally qualified health centers, we have 267 sites in the state and 43 of those are in rural counties or about 16%. Um, another thing that I want to talk about just briefly is a HIPSA. This is um, the guy who runs HIPSAs at our agency calls them a dark art, <laughs> but they're, they're a gate to about 60 different uh, federal programs, um, including things like loan repayment and all sorts of things. So it's a ratio of providers to a population with a whole bunch of caveats about how that's done. So we have maps of those on the DOH website if you're interested. There's 59 primary <laughs> care, uh, 35 mental health. And when they say mental health in HIPSA language, they actually mean psychiatrists, which to me is not mental health, it's psychiatrists, but that's what they're called. And then we have 33 dental HIPSAs. We have plenty of dentists. We have what's called maldistribution, Pugetopolis dentists. Just a couple more pieces of data. This is um, looking at the rural population without insurance and it's persistently higher than the state average. Um, I was showing this and there was a medical director from the healthcare authority in the room and he went, what? He was just, he couldn't quite believe it. He thought well, they'd fix that, um, but not true. It hasn't been fixed yet for rural residents. So some may like this cartoon, some may kind of go, what? But mom, we're playing hospital CFO and Tommy says his analytics are better than mine. What I'm trying to get at is in this new era of healthcare systems, being able to understand how people in your community are utilizing your system, at what cost, for what kinds of conditions and what services did you provide them, that's an analytic lift, right? The providences of the world and the multi-cares have entire squadrons of bright young people or bright old people or bright middle-aged people <laughs> that are working on that. What do you think they have in Chihuahua? Well, their province, I shouldn't go there. Um, let's go to Republic, right? They don't have that. So it's really rough for them to enter this new era. So there are challenges in this transformation of the system. St there's a health system in Dayton and they wouldn't care if I told you that they have an different electronic health record in their hospital, in their clinic, in their nursing home, um, and in their home health, right? So this is not uncommon. Um, even in some systems that have affiliated with a bigger system and gotten onto Epic or Cerner, it's only cut for their, for their inpatient and not radiated out to their whole system of care. So interoperability is not happening yet. We can't get the right information to the right people at the right time for the right patient. 
I talked about the asterisks on the compare scorecards. Workforce. If people ask me for five issues in rural, I would make three of them workforce. So how do you get momentum on a transformation when the chairs keep changing, right? When you have turnover, it's really hard to get change momentum. And all those public hospital districts, they have boards. And these folks do other professions, right? They're not healthcare people mostly. So how do you help them understand that the thing that they've understood about healthcare for the last however many years and the average age of board members in our state is 70 for these public hospital districts. And I don't mean to be ageist with that, I just mean that they've cared about their community and served it for a long time probably in that role. So how do you help them understand the new paradigm? Some of the CEOs in these health systems have tried to move into value-based and they've gotten fired by these boards who get really freaked out, like what are you doing? Because they don't have the map. They don't have the map to where it's going and they, they just go, oh, that looks dangerous to us, right? So that's a generalization, but there's a lot of truth to the generalization or turnover in these rural systems of leadership. Trying to work with this change is really high. Um, just the bandwidth for planning. I teased a woman up in Newport because she had five different roles on the bottom of her email. She said, yeah, I used to use a different email signature for each thing that I do, and I just got too confusing, so I just put them all in one, <laughs> right? I was up in Forks and the CNO, the chief nursing officer, was also the wound nurse. So when this, she left, they lost a wound nurse as well as the chief nursing officer. They had really two skill sets they had to recruit for. That's bandwidth. When you have people doing two and three jobs, how do you step out of taking care of patients to then do planning and looking ahead and strategizing? Their margins are a lot in the red. I think I glossed over the rule of thirds. They may have thought, what is she saying? What I was going to say is about a third of our rural health systems are in trouble. About a third are doing okay and about a third are thriving. The ones are thriving are, if you do the RUCA, they're closer to population centers or they have really attractive recreation, <laughs> right? White salmon doesn't do so bad, you know, windsurfing mecca that it is. Um, Odessa, and white salmon. They don't compete well for workforce. Mm -hmm. Narrow networks and bundles is becoming like the unintended consequence. So if I want to do control my accountable care organization and I want to control what happens in rehab, then when you come from an outlying rural area and you get your hip replaced, I want you to go to my rehab not the folks in your own community. So I want you to drive all that distance every day and really put you out and have you not afford the gas to get there, but it's okay because I need to control my network. So this is a, actually, I think, going to be one of the unintended side effects of value base that we're going to have to really look at for rural and try to protect rural and rural needs to figure out how to step up and intervene. All right, getting to the aging part. Let me pause there and see any confusion or questions about anything that I zipped through that was zippy. I'll ask, I just want to add that um, what Pat mentioned about workforce and the HIPSAs uh, was covered in detail with those maps in our grab rounds on workforce with Renee yep. Fullerton. And yep. so that you'll find that full lecture if you want to get more, if you want to hear the full story. Yeah, Renee goes deep on that. <laughs> I am the generalist. She is the specialist on that one. I just try to not embarrass myself when she's around. All right, so the gray tsunami, you may have heard about this. Um, even if you look at 2017 data, and I need to uh, get the 2018 data up. By the way, if you don't know this, the dirty little secret is the Office of Financial Management, you wouldn't think of that, you know, Googling that, but OFM holds all of the census data, tons and tons of demographic data, tables and tables and tables of ages and genders and ethnicity. So if you're looking for that stuff, OFM is the place to go, .gov. So even in the 2017 data, 20.3% age 65 and older rural compared to 14.6 in urban, but it is going to explode. And I'm going to go ahead to show you that. Um, and I, I think I have a slide here that's before another one, so I'll explain that it says an additional 10 counties. That relates to the next slide, so just ignore that for a moment. But you see a bunch of counties there in terms of where they are right now 
with a percentage over 65. But here's where I was going. So this shows you 2017, and these are the oldest counties, 20 projections that OFM puts together based on census data for 2025 and 2040. Jefferson County is the only county that goes down, but it goes down to become second <laughs> oldest. <laughs> I think some people would die in Port Townsend is what they're saying, but um, it's pretty substantial. So we're looking at a disproportionate aging bloom in rural. It's going to grow much faster there than it does in the urban areas and everywhere it's going to be something to be concerned with, but it's much bigger there. So in t when you think about our public systems, the Medicaid, Medicare combo, um, we're well known in the nation for our alternatives to nursing home care, for community-based care is the jargon, but it's largely been developed in the urban and suburban areas. And so when we did a study of this, we found out, well, it, it as the trail went, critical access hospitals were bleeding all kinds of money on the people they had in their swing beds, swing beds they can use for two things. They can use for skilled rehab under Medicare or long-term care under Medicaid or private pay, which is a kind of a misnomer for not much money to pay at all. So when we looked at those swing beds, and by the way, the Medicaid rates are based on large 100-bed facilities, they had a higher percentage in the facility of people with what's called a RUG score, which is a whole thing that says, how sick are you? How functional are you? So people were going to swing bed nursing home use earlier with fewer problems than their urban counterparts. So why? They don't have other choices, right? So those alternatives haven't been developed. Even towns that have been brave and set up an assisted living have had to close them because the assisted living rates were based on larger facilities too. So the, that thing about the economy of scale is really tough to do with small numbers of people. Um, so it's a problem. So when we just look at older adults, this is kind of like the duh slide. Um, they have more health problems. <laughs> How is that? Um, so about 80% of older adults have at least one chronic disease, 77% have at least two. There's another astounding stat that I didn't include about how many have five or six. Um, and then when you look at disability, there's disparity there as well. 17.54% in Washingtonians in non-metro areas. This was a split of metro, non-metro um, that the survey did, the uh, American Community Survey. But still, we've got more disability, we've got more illness, we've got more aging and fewer systems. It sounds like a, you know, the making of a perfect storm sort of, doesn't it? So a couple quotes from an aging fact sheet. Um, the aging of the baby boom generation could fuel a 75% increase in the number of Americans age 65 and older requiring nursing home care. And demand for elder care could also be fueled by a steeper rise in the number of Americans living with Alzheimer's disease, which could nearly triple by 2050. Opioids is gonna go out, dementia is gonna come in as the new public health crisis. It's already starting. And Alzheimer's is just one kind. I get a little concerned. I have a family member who has a vascular dementia. I have, know someone whose father has Lewy body. So there's a lot of different dementias. Alzheimer kind of gets all the press, um, but brains have all kinds of ways of getting into trouble as we age. And it's, Washington's a hot spot. I don't think we understand that well. Nationally, we're high. So now that I've got you thoroughly depressed, we'll go a little bit further. Um, so ARP did a survey, American uh, Association of Retired Persons, ones who keep sending me cards and I keep putting them in the trash. Um, I am qualified though for uh, what's the pancake place? I hop discount now. Um, <laughs> haven't taken them up on that. So eight and 10 strongly agreed with the statement. There's another dust slide. What I'd really like to do is remain in my local community as long as possible. So there's a guy, he's 97, he lives in Waitsburg. Anybody been to Waitsburg? Yeah, 
I love Waitsburg. I love those hills. He's lived in that town, in that house, since the day he was born, right? How cruel would it be for him to have to go out of there to get his care needs met? So we got to figure this out. And the happy part of that story is I'm working on a project on rural palliative care. And the testimonial from his family was that they were so happy that the care came to him and he could stay in his house in Waitsburg while he deals with a serious illness and still get his needs met. So people not only want to be in their town, they want to be in their house. I don't know about you, but I'm not eager to leave mine and go live in some impersonal place that I've never been. I kind of like that place called home. Home is like a metaphor too, isn't it? It means all kinds of things to us. It means independence. It means it gets to be my way. It means I can have my dog and my cat or my chicken or whatever. It's got all kinds of associations. And what do we need if we're feeling really sick and vulnerable? We need the people we love and who love us. And guess what? They are likely to be in kind of a close proximity around us. So if we get ripped away from that, there's tragedy there as well. Half of all men and about three fourths of women, because we live a little longer, over the age of 75 years live alone. Not surprising, another duh slide. But when you think about the implications of that, now down in Dayton, I I'm truly um, love the CEO down there and I will say it, I, I've you know, nominated him for a National Rural Community Star Award. He had his picture in HRSA. Um, but he said, you know, our homes here are designed to hurt people. You know, they were built in the 20s. They have steep stairways. They have bathtubs with big honking lips that are meant to help your foot. Um, essentially, a lot of the housing stock we have in rural communities are not something you can push a wheelchair through let alone a walker in some places, right? There's not a lot of railings. So we have all kinds of issues about just how we're gonna help people be safe in their homes. So here's kind of, you know, my perfect storm list. We're working up to the solutions here in just a minute. Sicker, older, poor, living alone, less public housing, less transportation, fewer community-based living alternatives, more barriers to home health. By the way, the labor, uh, Department of Labor federally says we're going to need a 64% increase in home care aids to respond to the boomers who want to stay home. Um, we have fewer of those in rural communities and we have these old houses. I'm going to read just a couple quotes before we turn into solutions together. So much of America's current health system remains poorly equipped to appropriately care for the seriously ill. A recent study of physicians found that a full two thirds of medical practices lack systems to assess patients' wishes or adequately assess symptom burden. And by symptom burden, what that means to me is, what does it mean to live with what you've got? Not like, how did you get it? How do we fix it? But what's it like on a day-to-day -day basis? These gaps leave patients and families with few viable options for the relief of symptoms and stresses, except for calling 911 or visiting the emergency department. Once there goes downhill, right? The severity of their underlying illness and their distress often results in admission where many of these patients decompensate. It's a lousy place to get care sometimes, even though good people are taking care of you. Poor function is costly. It's what older adults care about and it is virtually ignored in medical care. It is also modifiable. I think this is a platform for public health, frankly to care about function. Um, I, you know, the health system is gonna, there's two places in the health system that care about it, rehab and psych, right? <laughs> They're the ones who actually sort of get into that interdisciplinary view of function, but not so much in other places in the health system. Now there's bright stars that do it better, but as a system, we're poor at this, at looking at what does it take? You know, where is your laundry done? Do you have a way to get food? Do you have a way to store food that you can get to? That kind of thing. All right, so I've got some ideas about solutions, but this is the pause point where you get to tell me what you think would fix this. I've painted this picture. It's not like really rosy. <laughs> what would you do if you had a magic wand? What would you put in place? And there's no dumb suggestion, by the way. 
to me, it seems like we need to invest in our home care workforce. So that would be people that are normal community members. So if they're family members and friends, and they're the ones that are providing the actual services to people that need to age in place because the problem gets exacerbated if they move away from it, mm -hmm. then can we uh, make sure they're being compensated for this volunteer health service that they're offering to people within their community? Yeah, so to grow their own yeah. and supports for that. And I heard- help train them too, so there aren't issues like um, elder abuse right. or just poor care in general. Yeah. You know, you put older adults in pain and opioid dep epidemic and put them together, there's some risks with that kind of thing. I think I heard like a soft whispering in front of me, like, remember to push your button. Did I hear that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But no points off. That, two in a row, so I get points off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Other thoughts? And I, there is an approach working on that, by the way. I'll talk about it in a minute. But other ideas? Keep in mind that you will be there. Yeah. <laughs> the, think about what you would like that system to look like. Yeah. You get two alternatives, right? You get older or. <laughs> or not. <you laughs> or <don't>. not. <laughs> Which one do you want? Yeah. What do you think? What would help? Well done. <laughs> Not really. Yep, you're on. Um, I, I wonder, if, because we incentivize most every other thing, is the, uh, you know thinking about incentivizing uh, professional persons, whatever, however you define that, uh, to participate in. Um, in areas where they may, may not do that because there are issues. If you are a person who is just beginning or in your, in your discipline, you're gonna be interested in things like schools mm -hmm. and other issues that would keep you in that area. So it looks to me more like a community needs to decide how they're going to incentivize to get people to stay in their community. Yeah. So it's not just, as I call it, a public health thing. It's a community owned. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I mean, I think, I think there are some examples within the state of Washington. Yep. Where that the community has gotten together from a political as well as a social mm -hmm. yep. perspective to say, if we want to have physicians, nurses, blah, 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 in our community, we have to make it be that they would like to stay here. Yeah. Point well taken. Renee would love what you're saying. So I'm a nursing student at WCU and I'm writing my thesis project on getting more nurses into working with older adults. Um, and part of the reason why people don't want to work with older adults, especially in rural communities, is one, our clinical experiences aren't really that positive uh -huh. when we work in, with older adults. So if we could find a way to make home health like a rotation in our nursing education, I think that would help because a lot of us personally don't really know what home health really entails. Yeah. We're at, we're at Deaconess or Sacred Heart. Right. It's very different. Yeah. And you're seeing people at their, you know, at the, at their least functional when you're seeing them in that setting. Mm -hmm. I have a great quote from a home health nurse. She said, you know, I love it because I get farm fresh eggs. Now the downside is I sometimes have to help put in goats. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, how can we make the training more diversified and in settings where you can work with older adults in a way that feels feels good to the mission of why you're doing what you're doing? Exactly. Other thoughts? Yeah. So similarly, um, I am an occupational therapy student and I'm completing my capstone project right now on how to get more occupational therapists and allied healthcare professionals to work in rural areas. Yay. And um, the research that I've done shows that specifically incentivizing new grads to choose rural careers involves um, positive educational experiences about rural health, yep. positive clinical experiences in rural communities, and recruiting more students that grow up in rural towns. Yeah. And that third one is powerful. Um, Often, if you have family ties or you know what it is to be rural or you, you, know, you own your rural, 
you have a lot more idea about what it's like. And there are wonderful things. I've been giving you sort of the grim side. Can you guess at what some of the strengths are of working in a rural community? What, let's go there for a minute. So I'm an administrator and an assisted living facility in a rural community, Fairfield, south of here. Yeah. Um, what we struggle with is the cost of this living. And most of these people are not going to have their money saved up living in a rural setting. Yeah. Um, it's gone. And we got to look at our Medicaid rates. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. And in order, we're lucky we're open. Yes. But our town uh, just recently lost our clinic. And that is one of the pieces that helped us stay open. Yes. And we're actually here in the process of researching all our options. But if our Medicaid rates don't get addressed, I can't stay open. Yeah. And all those people, where do they go? But that alternative aging in place isn't just in their home sometimes. No, too, it's not. But in their community. That's right. And I have been fortunate to capture that. Yeah. And I keep people there and people who are from yeah. similar communities too, where they yeah. want to see the fields. They want to see yeah. that they grew up yeah. in Iowa. Yeah. But this is close enough. And we're being ignored by the legislation and a lot of stuff because we are rural. Yeah. And it's really frustrating, but our Medicaid rates need to change. Absolutely agree. And I want to be clear that being at home isn't the only place, right? I make it, yeah. I made, I made it sound like the Holy Grail, but it's not because you can have enough disability and sickness or frailty that you need other people's help and you need other people around, but you want to be with your buddies in your town. Yeah. Somebody back there, a couple of you. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is a positive to come to your positive yeah, point. Yeah, thank you. Um, one, they really appreciate you and you're a treasure to them that you come out there that you will give the time of day to yep. them. The other thing that could be a solution is within the community itself to know the strengths of the community members because maybe one member is going blind but another member is quite capable and can assist the other ones. Yeah. Learning how to communicate and work with what is in our community to help and support and nurture each other along the way I think is really valuable yeah. instead of staying alone which I think sometimes happens especially to widows, yeah. they tend to stay alone in their home and don't really venture out because they were so dependent upon their husband being yeah. the social entrepreneur for them too. So that would be a solution I would say is just looking within the community and helping to organize the community. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, one of the national solutions is called dementia friendly communities. You've heard about that? Yeah, which is the idea of how can we make it feel safe and comfortable for people who have uh, dementia and their family members to be out and about and not get isolated. Um, so I know there's a couple um, communities on this side of the mountains that are working with that and uh, developing it. I want to go after just a couple other strengths of rural communities from my perspective. They, they invented patient-centered, mm -hmm. right? It's the urban folks who have kind of have to remember what that looks like. They treat people with utmost, I mean, I'm generalizing here, but for the most part, they treat them like their neighbors and the people they see in the grocery store and they're accountable for the quality of their care. They also don't whine about not my job or we can't do that. They say, we'll get it done. We'll figure it out. So there's an enormous flexibility and strength and teamwork that happens to make it okay for the patients. They surround their vulnerable community members with a loving concern that I don't see other places. So now that said, not every rural community is the same, right? They have their own flavors. And sometimes you have a feud between two families that goes back three generations and better not put that one in charge of that one. But okay, somebody was being patient with me uh, that we had their hand up. Yeah. Did you hit your button? Push. Um, we've been looking at the loan forgiveness program. Uh huh. There's a lot of issues in it. I mean, it sounds really good on the surface, but when you actually get into it, the reimbursement rates are really bad and they make it very difficult and they'll change, you know, uh, things that you need to do halfway between it. And then it wipes you out if you don't cross a T or dot a I. So we've been working on looking at that and mm -hmm. starting to advocate for that. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's a really um, awesome solution to incentive you know get people to go yeah. especially with student loans mm -hmm. and yeah you know bring them to the rural communities 
but that program definitely needs some work right now, but it has the ability to be a good solution, you know, I think anyway, because I go. Yeah, yeah, I think it does too. I'll tell you my bias, and I'm not quoting the Department of Health, this is just me. I think it's been really focused on physicians, mm -hmm. right? And so um, kind of the top of the food chain thing. Um, and so it needs to pay more attention to other professions. And Renee, who works on my team, is my workforce person. She'd love to hear your ideas about what needs to fix. We don't control that program, but we are technically advisory to it. So we do have opportunities to give input. So yeah, I'll leave you a card. So yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah, button. Button, um, I, I pushed it. Push my buttons. Uh, uh, one of your slides, you mentioned functionality. Yeah. And I think that applies not just to the home, but also to the, the patient or the participant in their health care. So at an earlier age, when they come in and they engage with a health care provider, can they begin to talk about things and engage them in prevention, even though they're older adults? Yeah. So, like strength training or yep. mental health training through telehealth. These are all yep. things that our research has shown to be effective at um, improving the activities of daily living yep. and making sure that the quality of life is high and people are remaining in their homes. So the idea of primary prevention, I would say applies even more to older adults because yeah. it's when it becomes a big issue if they're not focused on these things like muscular health and mental yeah. health and bone health that they could end up not being able to live in their home. So Here. I would try to, for people that are going to provide services to older adults, just the idea of engaging them in things that they can do that would increase their ability to live independently and remain within their communities. Here, here. Uh, tai Chi, evidence-based approach to fall prevention, right? I want to, here's one for the OT in the room. So there's a, there's a model that I absolutely am in love with. Um, you're going to hear it again. Um, it's called CAPABLE, and that is an acronym, and I can never get all the words right, but it's community asset. Blah, 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 blah. CAPABLE, CAPABLE is, is out of, if you do it all caps, it's out of John Hopkins School of Nursing. It is a nurse, an OT, and a handyman or handy woman. And they go to low-income older adults homes and they ask what are their goals to, you know in terms of function and staying there and then the ot writes a work order for the adaptations to the home or to the you know equipment or you know in some one case it was you know getting weighted silverware for someone with parkinson's sometimes it's that simple and then they make it so they build railings and they put in steps and in one model um this uh handy person in this case a handy man was also training americorps volunteers so they were you know, making it generative. This has 10 replications and it has something like a six to one return on investment um, that John Hopkins just got a big private foundation grant to replicate this around the United States. And I just wrote them a plea saying I was smitten. <laughs> <laughs> and would they please think about replicating in rural Washington communities? Because I think they're on to it, which is a piece of, can we help work with the person and with their environment to make it as possible as we can and prevent things from happening. Because it's a slide, right? Mm -hmm. It's that whole slide. Once the hip is broken, things slide from there. What are your other thoughts? And I'll, in just a minute, or are we there? Oh, maybe we should turn it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get one last comment and then we're gonna do, do this pivot. We'll do the pivot now. That's actually, <clears throat> A perfect lead in um, what I will be discussing is taking the, all of this data and everything Pat's talking about is kind of coming from researchers and healthcare providers. What I'm going to present to you is what this looks like for aging people living in rural areas who have remained independent. And what I did, let's I left see. my um, solutions on there where people can get the slides and see those. Yeah, yeah. You, these will be available. They got most. Um, what we did was a photo voice project with elders that live in Lincoln and Stevens County here in Eastern Washington state. We had 12 elders for two years that took pictures of things that helped them stay independent. Now, all these elders were living by themselves. They were all, uh, independent and single, <laughs> and they, um, took pictures of things that kept them. They felt 
facilitated staying independent and the things that they were most afraid of, the things that were a danger to them. And so we have, I have just a small, I have almost a thousand pictures and stories from this project and I'm still sorting through all of them, but I have a small sampling for you. So you can see this through the eyes of some of the rural uh, elders who are actually out there living by themselves and what, what they're thinking. So this was our primary resource question, very broad based. This is a qualitative study. Uh, we didn't want to put any boundaries on it. We needed to know because we have, as researchers, we have blind spots and we need to know what we don't know. And photo voice is a great way to get at some of that. So for photo voice, we had a minimum number of uh, prompts and it was just the facilitators and barriers of your health and well-being. Once a month, we would bring the elders into a community center and I had a beautiful research team and we would sit down, we would download the pictures, we would listen to the stories, we would tag them to the pictures and create an absolute library of data of living in rural areas, which we're still working with right now. Um, we found uh, to this point, we have three primary categories. We looked at safety, we looked at home and health assistance and social connections were really the three threads we found through a lot of their stories. So first I'm gonna give you a few examples of safety, give you a few examples of social connections and give you a few examples of home and health um, assistance. So this is a big one. Uh, elders are very vulnerable in these rural areas. They're out there by themselves and many of the rural areas here in Washington state have spotty phone service. They don't have internet service. Um, unreliable utilities sometimes. Mm -hmm. And they have real fears of their homes being broken into and being uh, victimized. So this is an example that a woman took of, she not only has a alarm, her door locks, she got her, she got her door fixed, but she has a stick that will set off an alarm. It's really loud. She demonstrated it for us. But she also has bars in all of her windows. And you can think of what kind of stress it would be to an elder to live in not feeling entirely safe in your own home all the time. But for her, the value of staying in her own home was worth that stress. I want to emphasize that. And it, Pat mentioned it beautifully, the home is a super dangerous place. And so we got lots of pictures of where our elders injured themselves, lots of hip breaks. So this is an example of some of those steep stairs, um, which at, before did not have the carpet on it. And she fell, she broke her hip. She was very lucky somebody happened to come by that day. She said she wasn't expecting company for two more days. She said she would not, she would still be on the floor and in probably much, much worse condition as you can imagine. Um, it, when she passes by this spot in her house, it reminds her every time about how lucky she got, how important it is to have those connections and people coming by, but also that she needs to be careful in her movements around her own home. And in Eastern Washington, we get weather extremes. And this was something, we actually lost two of our members of our cohort because their house was burned down last summer in the wildfires. And um, it was, so you'll see the one in the top right uh, was a photograph that someone actually thought to take, which God bless them. <laughs> um, in rural Washington, you have extremely dry summers. You guys are all very familiar with our wildfire season. It's, un, we're hardly, we can hardly breathe. And when you're in the rural areas, that fire can move very quick, very quick and pr provide a great danger very quickly. And again, the communication systems aren't always great. You don't always know when the fire is moving your way in an efficient time. The other danger that our seniors really highlighted is the snow. They frequently get blocked in their houses and they can't open doors, they can't open windows because the snow has, you know, slid off the roof and built up outside their door. Uh, they've come up with many very innovative <laughs> home adaptations to help prevent this, but usually it takes a, an awful event of being locked in your house for a few days before they get to that point. And again, they think about how lucky they were that they may have had a connection that who, someone, who, oh, sorry, someone who stopped by and was able to assist them and help get them out of the house. <clears throat> so
So for social connections in our rural areas, churches are central. They're not just places of worship. They are bingo halls. They are food pantries. They are ice cream socials. They are, you know, where you hang out, play with the kids, you meet your family. They are all in one social centers. And for there are way more churches in rural Washington than there are clinics or health centers or fitness centers or anything to that extent. So really utilizing and understanding the value of these churches and beyond being a place of worship that they serve this much greater community need. We have lots of lots of pictures of different beautiful churches throughout um, rural Eastern Washington. And this is one of my favorite pieces that's up and coming in the research is multi-generational uh, interplay. So this woman, these two kids here, one, the boy has severe ADHD and will not be taken in by any childcare or preschool in his area because he's so hyperactive. And his sister has a heart condition. And the mom is a single mother working barely above the poverty level, you really, out of luck as in terms of childcare. One of the elders that we had volunteered to watch her kids for her. And she says, you know, she the mom doesn't pay her, but she said working with the kids and hanging out and interacting with them is good for her. And she listed my brain, my arthritis, and my soul. And she's like, yeah, I can't keep up with the little boy. Like he just bounces off the walls and goes, but he's like, good. I let him go, <laughs> let him get it out of his system. She ended up getting a, a dog there because it helped keep the boy active, someone who can keep up with him. But that, that intersection of not isolating our elders, that they do play, a, they can play a role with our kids and our um, up and coming generations, that we don't need to separate them and keep them isolated. There's some real function there and benefits for both. And in, also in terms of social connection in rural areas, and Pat actually mentioned this a little bit, it's not just about interacting with the living. It's the connection and the family history and the sense of place. And when you have generations who have lived in the same land, people are, their families buried in those, in, on that land, that not only staying um, not up and moving to the urban center is not an option. Just doesn't even occur to them that that is a thing to do. They absolutely want to stay where they have the memories and the spirit. Ooh, I've got to stop hitting the microphone. The memories and the spirits of their loved ones that are around them. So it's very important to really think about that from the elder's point of view, that it's not just, well, mom, why don't you just move to Spokane? You know, you can, then you can just be near all the services. That there's a lot of things about the place itself that really keeps elders happy and healthier than if they were to be stripped away from that. <clears throat> Of the thousand pictures, I must have 500 pictures of pets. <laughs> Fish, rabbits, chickens, goats, dog, oh, dogs and cats, dogs and cats. Um, but we all know, any, any health professional knows. <laughs> any health professional knows the value of pets to mental health and well-being. Uh, not only keeping our elders company, but also providing a level of security. And so most of, almost all of our elders had dogs, cats, and other um, pets that they said were very central to their health and well-being, keeping them engaged, keeping them moving. Moving was a big part. Like, I got to get up. I got to walk the dog. But that's a really important piece of, of their role. I saw a stat today that said that there are more pictures of people's pets than of their husbands. Yes, <laughs> absolutely true. And getting to actually, and Pat also mentioned um, the home modifications are huge. Yeah, the homes are absolutely not built for people aging in place. Um, we had lots of pictures of piles of medicines and supplements that, you know, they would say they have to stock up because they can only get to the pharmacy every so often. There's not a pharmacy nearby that they can get to. So they stock up. And they absolutely say if I run out or if something gets wet accidentally or the roof starts leaking, that they could really be out of luck without the, those meds. And so managing medication and supplement use is a huge issue. The toilet. I love the toilet because the toilet is representative of <laughs> homes being adapted for elders. We had one elder who was petrified of dying Elvis Presley style. 
She's like, she, one day she had a regular standard toilet, she could not get up. And she feared for her life because she said, I'm going to be here for a week. They're going to come find me and I'm going to be on this gun toilet. <laughs> and that would be really embarrassing and I don't want that. So simple enough, you, we found a foundation that could get her a raised toilet and it has changed her life. She talks about her toilet at any opportunity because she just thinks we don't talk about toilets enough and the role of toilets in health and well-being and keeping people happy. So think of, just think about that. <laughs> What's this? Nope. What? No. Close. Sort of. I've given, I've shown this picture to people all over the world and no one knows what this is. <laughs> it's for her prosthetic. And getting, when we think about elders, chronic disease, tons of diabetes, two of our elders had prosthetics that require maintenance and management and care because without their prosthetic, it changes what they can do in their own home greatly. So this box was revolutionary to one of our uh, women because it maintained her, her prosthetic in a nice upright position where it wouldn't be banged around at night. She wouldn't trip on it when she got out of bed. She could find it easily when she was trying to get out of bed. It makes it easy to put on for her. So we don't really talk too much about prosthetics, but a lot of our elders, especially with long-term diabetes, you'll find de varying degrees of prosthetics that require uh, levels of maintenance and care. Good, yeah, like yeah, exactly. And it smells fantastic. <laughs> so as... Uh, Pat was also mentioning, and I just love that it just totally unintentionally, but the presentations really nicely complement each other. Um, the car, we have lots of pictures of cars, probably second to pets. How people get around in rural areas, there's no STA. There might be a shuttle bus once in a while to the casino or that might go to some other places, but they're really reliant on their cars. And our elders, because they were independent, they were all still driving, but they were also all very cognizant of counting the days that they knew that they were probably not going to be able to drive for much longer. And if you can't drive in rural areas, you're really stuck. So. Um, just the the reliance and the font you can see dora the explorer she's very very sweet very attached to it but all of them very attached to their vehicles because again that's a huge connection to how they get out and socialize with their communities and get to their doctor's appointments i was telling about earlier that we actually had very few pictures of clinics or healthcare systems from our uh, elders a lot of it was more home-based stuff um, but one elder did take a picture of their uh, local clinic because it stopped taking Medicare and they had to go 50 miles in a different direction to get care. And this is an increasing uh, issue that we're finding, and I, we mentioned a little bit, the resistance of a lot of providers to take Medicaid and Medicare. They don't have to, folks. They absolutely are within their rights to not take those insurances. Um, but that's a huge barrier for our elder population because that really narrows the possibilities and the access. This is my favorite picture. Because um, why, this, why this picture is so important to me is hopefully it'll remind you all, don't forget the small stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I sat down with this woman and we came across this picture and I had to do a double take. Like, is that your bra? <laughs> And she said, okay, look, listen, yes, because I spend upwards of 10 minutes trying to get this damn thing on every morning. And if I can't get, she was a very endowed woman. She said, if I can't get this on, I'm not going out. And so when her arthritis gets really bad in her shoulders, she stays home. Okay. So there can be very simple, fixable things for our elders that we're overlooking. I mean, you're not going to find that on a lot of health assessments, like, can you put your bra on? But that's one of the issues that'll keep her, she's, it, it will keep her from going out. So um, don't forget the small, it can be some of the small stuff. Um, when I showed this uh, slide to another audience of health professionals, I actually had one woman was like, well, why don't she just turn it around and put it on the front way? And then she went to show me how you would, you know, flip it around to the back. And when she did that, 
she tweaked her shoulder. It went, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so we'll finish on a big smiley face. And what this really comes down to is that if people are happy and secure and they may not need all the things we think they need, they really know what makes a good life and a high quality of life for them. And so we really need to pay attention to what the elders say is important to them. Not just because we're healthcare providers, we know what they need. We need to listen to what they had to say and what is really valuable to them. So we're directing our care in the right direction. Um, more isn't always better. And sometimes finding those small things that can make a huge difference can go a long way. We really can sell the simple things pretty short sometimes. So I'll read this to you. This is a picture colored by my granddaughter. It represents happiness, enjoying, and smiling. It's about what life should be about, enjoying my surroundings. I was happy when we moved here uh, to the reservation to retire. And if you're happy with where you are, then that can impact your health for the better. And I think that's very wise. All right, and so just a quick thank you. I did not do this alone. I had a small army of... Uh, graduate research assistants that helped me collect this data. So I always like to make sure I mention and give them credit. Um, and so with that, do we have any questions, comments, thoughts, more solutions? We're just a little past five. Yeah, Thomas. Um, when I see a presentation like this, I always throw multiple ideas that are roaming around my head. So I think the first one, and I don't know how feasible this is, but imagine for every older adult in the rural area, if something like this were to happen to them, where they could go through their home and they could show people what it's like. So someone could assess their environment and see where the potential pitfalls are. And then to learn about the things that are impacting their health, like a bra, which I'm sure does not come up in a normal, quick conversation. The second thing um, is, the idea of the church in the community. So it seems like um, building health ministries is a potential intervention in rural health. And I know many of the big healthcare providers, that's a part of what they offer is they'll have a team that'll go out and they'll work with um, concerned members of a congregation and help them build their own health ministry, which can become like a primary prevention forefront for members in the within their congregation yeah. and then lastly and it, um, it seems like emergency preparedness is a big issue so mm -hmm. what are people engaged in the fact that something like a big snowstorm or a fire puts um, older adults at particular risk are we preparing for this so that uh, we can respond to the the need when it happens so someone doesn't have to be burned alive in their home or trapped in their home. We didn't have anyone burned alive. They, oh, they were good. out of their homes when their homes burned down. Sorry. Right. <laughs> or lo just losing. But is yeah. so was that in place, the emergency preparedness? No. And it's really rural emergency preparedness for our elders was very much an after the fact issue. We actually have one of our students, Brittany, is that's her focus right now, is looking at elders and emergency preparedness in her community. So that's something that students in our program are currently looking at, so. Yes. I think what we also need to remember is educating our families mm -hmm. because they're going in, um, and this is kind of just an experience that just happened, is these family members, someone does fall breaks the hip, they go to these facilities, say, facilities that are saying they're only going to be safe if they move to a urban area because mm -hmm. it's closer to the hospitals. They are making it sound like that their aging family members cannot stay where they're at and that that is not an option when it is. And that's kind of a failure in that system, in the bigger box systems of healthcare mm -hmm. that they want to keep them in their systems and they refer out to their affiliates. And they're not allowing these people or these family members to research or even have the knowledge that they can go home. And I think an outreach to family members and the aging population is a necessary piece. There needs to be forums in the communities and saying, if you have aging family members, you know, we've got these specialists to come out and visit that. But we're forgetting these family members are making these decisions 
now and they're being made fearful of putting their parents back in their home because they were told it's not safe. Uh, you know, that's, I appreciate that point. I think that's where the rural communities can get proactive in really giving that message. The flip side too is that urban areas will discharge people back to their home and not tell the urban health system and the supports that would surround that person if they knew they were coming and they learn about it because they show up at the emergency department really out of control and decompensating. So yeah, there's a lot to do with that. Other comments or questions? I'm just going to make a little comment about 40 years ago when I lived in Great Britain, we watched teams, a nurse, um, an OT and a PT came into the community, into usually the church, and t the whole community would come in, and it was very rural out there where we lived in Scotland, and the whole team would talk to the family members, we would go out to the homes, we would deal with the problems in the individual homes, but it was just really the community that came around. We need to look back at some of the things that worked and go back to not always are we being compensated for it or are we being reimbursed for it, but what can work for the community? I think a lot of times in our training systems, we like anything, if it's not new, it's outdated. And if you find these things are very cyclical and I remember finding I was I did my dissertation on interdisciplinary teams and pace programs okay. and um, <laughs> I was delving the literature as you do with a dissertation way back Inter interdisciplinary teams go back over a hundred years yeah. in concept yeah. so there's plenty and we all know what those obstacles are they're very political and they're very financially motivated they don't always make sense it's not really about care it's about you know, boundaries and professionalism and you can do this and you can't do that. And it's not to the benefit of the patient, absolutely. And so I think look, looking at different models that have worked and PACE is a great, I think a great example because they're federally mandated, required to have an interdisciplinary team. It's something like 11 providers, it's incredible. But that team serves the person in all facets. And thinking of how to scale those programs to serve more, I mean, is certainly another possible model. But yeah, I think there are great models out there. I almost mentioned PACE because I tried to set one up years ago and in a fairly larger town. But we just got a national consultant on PACE programs to run the numbers in Washington communities. And they did this whole you know, stepwise look at it. And the numbers don't work with the current capitation rate. Yeah. But we need to fix that because what yeah. Uh, the home health testimony on their bill was um, they can provide a month of home health for the same cost as one day in the hospital, mm -hmm. right? And I think if you took the PACE program, you could come up with a similar kind of comparison of cost. No, absolutely. And that's the thing. I think a lot of clinicians and future clinicians, you don't entirely realize how much financing systems are going to dictate what kind of care you get to provide. You don't get you don't get that much of a say. <laughs> you will be uh, limited a lot by who you get to work with, by what your credentials are, and your scope of practice, and what kind of insurance they have. Um, so I think thinking and mobilizing in some way ways to change our payment system. We're getting there with the value based payments. We're starting to break away from the fee for service. Just starting. But there's some momentum of figuring out a different way to do this that might be able to fund better, more patient-centered, more team-based mobile care. At that point, Dayton, yeah, Dayton uh, who's one of our palliative care demonstration sites, and they did a, sort of a quick and dirty initial data poll and showed for the patients that they were serving in that program, they had a 68% reduction in emergency department visits. Wow. It really has to be about saving and value and less about time in, you know, visits and tests and we're getting there extremely slowly. Um, back to Thomas's point about the churches too. I mean, we were talking about um, libraries, really thinking, and I've brought up Meals on Wheels in a few different um, examples, thinking of non-traditional healthcare providers that work in rural communities already that may have a network and access that, you know, might be able to kind of, we don't really think of these people as being part of our health system, but this is what we do in public health. We figure out a way for everyone to be in and to be a part of our health and community health. Um, 
And so really thinking if we want to move in a innovative direction, a lot of that can probably come from looking at non traditional providers, non traditional places of um, where uh, care can happen and where um, people might be able to provide check ins or connections. Um, don't don't discount things just because they're not labeled a healthcare clinic that there's a potential that more of these other rural uh, resources can play a part. There's another point that you hit on, which has to do with the rigidity of kind of our roles and the divisions between things and you're eligible for this and not that. I think rural needs greater flexibility in role and program. Yes. And I'll give an example. And if Rada, uh, my buddy Rosalinda, who runs the health system there, has an assisted living long term care. Uh, primary care, rural health clinic, and a hospital. She has four different credentials for four different, you know, she has medical assistants in the clinic and she has nurses aides in the, or nurse assistants in the, and anyway, you get the idea. She has another credential in assisted living, whatever that name of that one is, and a different one in long-term care. And she can't swap them, right? She can't put the right person in the right place that day for the right patient because they all have different requirements of education and training. That's fixable. In fact, my agency could be the ones who fix that. So um, you heard I it here first. Yeah, <laughs> like I can do it by myself. <laughs> I have been called Donna Coyote a time or two, but Donna, you're being called out <laughs> if you're watching this. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you all for coming uh, and for staying a little bit extra. It was a really great conversation. Thanks for your participation. Next March, we have Firearm Injury and Violence with Therese Hansen from the State Health Department and Jordan Ferguson um, from our local Sheriff's Department um, who will be talking with us. And April will end our series for the year with Medicaid transformation. Ooh. <laughs> But this is important stuff. If we're talking about changing Medicaid rates and how we do things, this is part of what's happening right now. They're trying to figure out how to do it. Um, so please, these are open to everyone. Um, we hope to see you next month. Thank you.